You know I'm so grateful that I found the Lord in time. And since this relationship, it's really changed my life. But still, I can't help but think of so many others who haven't heard the wonderful story. And that's why I'm singing this song to tell it. Listen. It was a shame the way they crucified my Lord. But yet and still, he laid down his life. They stretched him wide, nailed the nails in his hands. They hung him high. He was the ultimate sacrifice. Wait a minute. Mm. But on the third day, he rose with all power in his hand. And for his true disciples, there's something we must understand. He said, go and teach all nations, what he said. baptizing them oh, yeah. in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost name. And that's why I've got to tell it. Yeah. And you've got to tell it. How will they know? How will they ever know? Oh, 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 oh. tell it. Tell it, I gotta tell oh, it. Everywhere tell you it. go, everywhere I go, I got something else I wanna tell you. Hey. Even on Even our jobs, there's something we've gotta do. Gotta do Instead baby. of talking about this and that, we need to spread the good news about how, how Jesus, Jesus suffered, bled, and died. And on that cool cross that day So that the world might be saved Come on, God We need to tell them to hear God's word And believe it with all your heart Repent of every one of your sins And confess Christ as the Son of God Go down in the watery grave And be baptized You'll come up a brand new creature in Christ. It's up to you and I to tell it. Oh, we've got to tell it. Oh, how will they ever know? Unless we tell them, please don't wait too late. Hey, you better tell some. See, that's what he told us to do And the cold thing about it It will be a sad day To hear somebody say My friend, you knew the truth But you still let me go astray So why, why won't we tell the world That Jesus is coming again And tell me who shall be able to stand Unless we tell them, we've got to tell them, how else will they know? Oh, there are so many out there lost, that's why we got to tell them, our friends and our kin and our loved ones. We'd like to welcome you to the 2021 Windy City Lectureship Convocation. We are extremely grateful to the great God of Heaven for all of His blessings that He has so enrichly bestowed upon us. We're thankful for His extended grace, His beneficent mercy and watch care. So all through this week, from Sunday afternoon through Thursday evening. We will have four presenters, four on Sunday at three o'clock, and then on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, beginning at 7.30 p.m. And this is Central Standard Time. We will feature four different speakers. 
it would be in your best interest to tune in each evening because only the speakers that are designated for that evening will be viewed on Facebook and YouTube. Now after the lectureship is over, then the entire program can be viewed in its entirety. But during the dates of July 11th through July 15th, only those speakers on their designated dates will be viewed. We're happy to have uh, guest preachers from various areas across the Brotherhood. And so again, we ask for your prayers and your continued encouragement as we seek to serve the Sovereign and to uplift our risen Redeemer, to edify one another, to encourage one another, to exhort one another, to extol one another in the principles and the doctrine of New Testament Christianity. May God bless you. And thank you again for tuning in, and may he keep you in the providence of his will. Hello, I'm Brother Mark Bro from the Ninth Street Church of Christ here in Paducah, Kentucky. I want to thank Brother David Penn for this opportunity that he's allowed me to be able to speak at the 12th Annual Windy City virtual lectureship. I thank you so much, Brother Penn, for this opportunity. I pray that God will continue to enrich and bless your life, as well as those who will be speaking on this lectureship, their families, and to all of those who are listening. I pray that these messages will be a source of blessing in your life. The theme that has been chosen for us is a journey with Joseph dealing with chapters 37 through 50. Once again, Brother Penn, thank you so much for this opportunity. Before I go into my lesson, I would like to open up with a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you for this day. Thank you so much for all your many blessings. Thank you for this opportunity that's been allowed to me to be able to speak unto others your word. We pray for Brother Penn. We thank you for the foresight and the vision that he's had over the years in getting these lectureships together. I pray that you'll continue to bless him and bless all of those who will be speaking on this lectureship. May you empower our lives and help us, God, to hide behind the cross and always seek to do your will. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A journey with Joseph. What I have chosen for a topic, as we're looking at Genesis chapter 37 through 50, I have chosen for my topic, holding your position in spite of opposition. Holding your position, the position that God has given us. How do we hold on to that position? in spite of opposition. Today, I want to speak to those of us who are experiencing some very difficult times in their lives. When life becomes difficult, we sometimes become disheartened and depressed. The reality is, is that we're living in a world, and even sad to say, by some Christian who seem to appear to be disinterested toward your pain. They are in denial about racism, injustices, equality, and fair treatment toward the poor. Instead of listening and learning, they work harder to devalue your worth, discredit your name and your dignity, when it seems that your cries and your pleas are dull toward those you're speaking to, we get tired of being disappointed. Our disappointments, if we're not careful, can lead us to start to distrust others and distrust God and distrust one another. So the question becomes, how do you hold your position when you are faced with so much opposition? How, how do you continue 
to walk in the spirit, even though your flesh wants to respond? How, how do you continue to hold on when you're about to let go of the road? Most of us, if you're like me and many other times, there's been a point in all of our lives where we, where we make these statements, we're saying, I'm tired of being mistreated. I'm tired of being misrepresented. I'm tired of misinformation constantly being circulated. I'm, I'm tired of the church ignoring, suppressing, being selective, and refusing to speak up, stand up, for those who are being mistreated. Well, I want you to know that Joseph can relate to our situations. Let's look at the oppositions that Joseph faced. In Genesis chapter 37, verse number five, Joseph faced his brothers, his own flesh and blood, hating him. In Genesis chapter 37, Verse number 11, his own flesh and blood was jealous of him. In Genesis chapter 37, verses 18 through 24, his own flesh and blood plotted to kill him and threw him into a pit without any water. And you're talking about how to hold on? When the opposition is against you and that opposition comes from your own family, how do you hold your position in the midst of your opposition, especially in this text, when it's coming from your own family? In Genesis chapter 37, verses 26 through 28, they sold him into slavery. Genesis chapter 37, verse number 28, they brought Joseph and sold him into Egypt. Joseph lands in Egypt, but Joseph had much opposition to face. Not only did Joseph face opportunity, in the midst of all of this that's going on, Joseph also had to deal with temptation. Yes, temptation come at the worst moment. Yes, temptation arises when you're dealing with a multiplicity of things that are happening in your life. Well, the temptation that Joseph faced was in Genesis chapter 39, verses seven through nine. It came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph and she says to Joseph, Joseph, I want you to lie with me on top of already having to deal with the opposition within your own family, the circumstances that you're dealing with, the hurt, the pain, the disappointment, now here comes a temptation from, from his master's wife saying, Joseph, lie with me. But the Bible says, but Joseph refused because Jew Joseph knew that God had a plan for his life. Joseph knew that in spite of all the opposition that he had to faith, he could not give in to the temptation. So he says in Genesis chapter 39, verse 9, there is no one great in the house and I, and he, meaning her, 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 his master, has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then? Could I do this great evil and sin against God? Sometime when you're faced with opposition, sometime when you're in the depth of the, the pain that you're going through, sometimes Satan will devise a temptation to get you off track. And Joseph said, how then could I do this great evil and sin against God? But of course, she did not listen to him. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 39, verse 10, she constantly kept asking. Then we get in verse number 12. She says this to Joseph. She caught him by his garment, saying, lie with me. And he left his garments in her hand and fled and went outside. I find this phrase, Lie with me. Very interesting phrase. A very important 
phrase, especially when you're going through a difficult time. Because sin wants us to lie with him. Sin wants us to lie in despair. Sin wants us to lie, to live in bitterness. Sin wants us to lie or live in hatred, anger, revenge. Oh, woe is me. Sin wants us to lie in depression, wallow and feel helpless in these situations. That's what sin wants us to do. So we see here that Joseph had opposition. The opposition came from within his own family that hated him. Not only did he have that, he was tempted with temptation, like we all get tempted to lie with things that will take us from our purpose. Joseph knew that if I lie with you, I will not be able to fulfill the purpose that God has designed for me. So how was Joseph able to hold his position in spite of opposition. First thing I want you to see that's very important is that Joseph had God's favor in his life. God's favor, an unmerited gift was given to Joseph by God. Genesis chapter 39, verse number two, the Lord, was with Joseph. Whenever you're going through your difficult time, I know you already know this. I'm only reminding you of something you already know, but especially coming out of a pandemic, especially dealing with race war, especially dealing with death and all the economic disadvantages, people are, are, are loaded down with family issues, financial issues. So many things can can come upon God's people, we need to understand that God is with us. If we stay faithful to his call, God is with us. So the Bible said the Lord was with Joseph in the midst of the opposition, in the midst of the temptation. So he became a successful man. Genesis chapter 39, verse number four. So Joseph found favor in his sight and he became his personal servant and he made him overseer over his house and all that the, he, the master owned, he put it in Joseph's charge. Satan thought he had him. Satan sold him. Satan put him in a pit. All the opposition that Joseph was going through, but God had a purpose in his life. So God's favor was with Joseph. We see in Genesis chapter 39, verse 21, the Lord, the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. God gave him favor. We see in Genesis chapter 39, verse 22, the chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail. So whatever was done there, he meaning Joseph was responsible for it. And then we see in verse 23 of Genesis chapter 39, the chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, no matter what the opposition was, and I'm saying to us today, yes, we're faced with so many obstacles, but when we stay faithful and committed, even when we fail, God, we got to get back up and keep trying again because the Lord will bless us just as he blessed Joseph. We see phrases in Genesis chapter 40, 
41, we see phrases where Pharaoh said to Joseph in verse 41, see, I have set you over the land of Egypt. What is God doing? Why is God setting Joseph up to be the man over Egypt? In Genesis chapter 41, verse 43, we see again, and he set him over all the land of Egypt. See, God had a purpose for that. God had a design for that. Yes, you're going through opposition. Yes, you're going through temptation. But I want you to stay faithful to me. We don't always get it right, y'all. We don't always say it right. But when we fail, we got to get back up. We got to learn from our failure. Get back up and keep trying. Because, see, God has his favor on his children. And when God has his favor on his children, it does not matter what the world keeps trying to do. It doesn't matter how much Satan is trying to hold you back. God will prosper our lives. Now here's some very important things to remember. Why is this so important to hold your position in spite of your opposition? When God has his faith on you, then you become a blessing to your family. Our families are being challenged right now. Because we sometimes give in to those temptations. We sometimes allow the opposition to cause us to become frustrated and we get out of the purpose that God designed for us. But God blessed Joseph. And with that blessing, Joseph now has a family. Well, why is the family so important? In Genesis chapter 41, verse number 51 and 52, the Bible says Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh. For he said, God has made me forget all of my trouble and my father's Household. Verse 52, he named his second Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Oh, this is so important. Joseph now has a family. God has blessed him with Manasseh and Ephraim, but those names have a purpose behind them. Forgetful and fruitful. Joseph could not be the type of man that God needed him to be for his family if he did not forget the afflictions, the injustices, the mistreatments that was done to him in his life. Well, what does this Hebrew word Nasha means. What does forget really mean? It means to not let something dominate one's thinking. It's not that he did not remember it. It's not that he tried to totally erase it out of his mind. No, what he did not allow to do was allow it to dominate his thinking because he had to keep his mind on the purpose that God had designed for him. And that was not only important for Joseph, that was important for his wife, that was important for his children, because if you cannot stick to the purpose that God gave you, you will be dwelling on the mishaps in your life out of those things sometimes called bitterness, anger, frustration. So instead of you pronouncing blessings to your family, instead of you being the spiritual leader for your family, sometime if we get overcome with the obstacles and the op oppositions that we face, we become bitter and we spew that bitterness in our families. 
But Joseph said, God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Did you hear that? Fruitful in affliction. Prosperous in affliction. Because Joseph could not afford to allow those mishaps in his life to dominate one's thinking. My brothers and sisters, there is power in our mind and our mind has power and we must allow the goodness and the grace of God to dominate our thinking instead of the things that happen that was not fair in our life. So these two children that Joseph was blessed with, forgetful and fruitful, the man was bearing the fruit that God wanted him to bear, spiritual fruit, not carnal fruit. Fruit that comes from the spirit of God. Love, joy, peace, long sir. Only the spirit of God can help us to produce those type of fruit. But we must not allow the negativity that is happening to our life to dominate one's thinking. He could have submitted to his flesh. And we get fleshly things that come from that. So Joseph was a blessing for his family. God blessed him to forget, and because of that, he became fruitful. Why is that so important? Because God had a purpose for Joseph's life. And it was important for Joseph to hold his position in the midst of opposition. So he became a blessing to his family. He was able to forget and be fruitful, which leads to my next point. Now Joseph became a blessing to those who caused him the burdens. Oh, my brothers and sisters, God is good. Only God can do this. We can't do this in our own power. We will fail every time. I know if you're like me, there have been many times in my life I failed in this. But I thank God for his grace and his mercy for giving me another chance and another chance. But Joseph was able to bless the very people who caused him the burden. Genesis chapter 42, verses 1 through 3. Now Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt. Well, where was God leading Joseph to Egypt. Why? Because God had a purpose for Joseph in Egypt. It didn't matter what the devil tried to do to throb or hurt that purpose. God had a purpose for him. Now Joseph is in Egypt. Well, what else is in Egypt? There's grain in Egypt. Well, what's going on? There is a famine in the land. Well, who is it that needs the grain? Joseph's family. Well, who was his family? They threw him in the pit. They hated him. They sold him into slavery. But God had a purpose. God had designed for him to be in Egypt. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 42, verse 2 and 3, Jacob said, Behold, I heard there was some grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us from that place so that we may live and not die. Then the 10 brothers of Joseph went down to buy grain from Egypt. Watch Genesis chapter 45, verse four through eight. Then Joseph said to his brothers, 
come closer. They came closer. And he said, I'm your brother Joseph. I'm the one you sold into Egypt. Do you see how good God is? When you hold your position in the midst of your opposition, God will bless you to be forgetful and God will bless you to be fruitful. But God will also put you in a position to where you become a blessing to the people who cause you to burden. He said in verse five, don't be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. God sent me here to preserve your life. God had it all designed. My last point to you and I today, no matter what we've gone through, and it's been a tough two years. Pandemic, political uproar, racial division, economic hardships, family disruption, schools in disarray, having to make quick adjustments, colleges, Families are, are being shipped around trying to make all things work. Separation from your loved ones due to the pandemic. In the midst of all of that, I want you to be reminded that God has his favor on his children. But we got to stay faithful. Even when we fail, even when we mess up, get back up and keep your eyes on the position that God gave you. And when you do that, you can say what Joseph said in Genesis chapter 50, verse 19 through 21. Joseph said to them, don't be afraid, for I'm in God's place. I'm not going to do to you what you did to me, even though I had the opportunity or the authority to do it. But what's important about this is I'm in God's place. God has a purpose for me, and I got to hold on to the place where God has given me. He said in verse 20, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I'm going to provide for you and your little one. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Church, we cannot win. We cannot overcome. We cannot be victorious using the weapons that the world uses. We must use those weapons that God gave us. Joseph had no control of the difficulties that he was born into. But Joseph did have control of what he allowed it to do to him. Hold on to your position my brothers and sisters, in spite of your opposition. Once again, thank you, Brother David Penn, for this opportunity that you gave me to be able to preach 
God's word. Thank all of those who will be speaking on this lectureship, A Journey with Joseph. I pray that this word will strengthen you, revive your hope, revive your faith, revive your love, and hold on to your position because God has a purpose in your life. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to be able to bring your word. We're praying, God, for this lectureship that it will energize our people to keep their faith and trust in you. Thank you for biblical characters like Joseph to help us all see that we can make it in this world of difficulties and pain. Thank you for all you've done. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God bless you and may he keep you. Oh, there is one whom I know. He loves me and so I'll honor and I'll praise his holy name. Yes, he's with me every day and he helps me along my way. He's your God when I'm troubled. He's your God. My Savior will be my God, and He'll stay close by my side. He's your God when I'm lonely. He's your God when I'm troubled. He's your God. I may be sober. He's your God. I may be motherless. He's your God. I may be tired. He's your God. Yes, He is. I know I have a Savior, and I know He my guy, I know that he'll stand by me, he's always by my side, I can call him late at night, I know he'll make my burdens light, he's your guy, when I'm lonely, he's your guy, I am tired, he's your guy, I may be so burdened, he's your guy, I may be lonely, he's your guy, when I am friendless, he's your guy, Soon I'm going to heaven I'm going there to stay What a happy meeting When I see Jesus that day Sisters and brothers up there In that land so bright and fair He's your God when I'm burned He's your God when I'm troubled He's your God when I'm tired We will be reading this morning from Genesis chapter 37. So go ahead and head there. And this little guy is going to be a preacher. I like this little guy here. Um, Genesis chapter 37, first book of the Bible. Let's pick up there. Um, and if you have it, say amen. Go to verse number 17 of Genesis chapter 37, verse number 17 and we will read to verse 29 the Bible says I'm reading New King James version and the man said they have departed from here for I heard them say let us go to Dothan so Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan now when they saw him afar off even before he came near them they conspired against him to kill him then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. 
and we shall say some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, Let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, but cast him into this pit which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to their father. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers, they stripped him of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water in it, and they sat down to eat a meal. Then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites from Gilead with their camels bringing spices, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our own brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother in our flesh. And his brothers listened. Then the Midianite traders passed by. So the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. I want to talk to you this morning from a subject entitled, A Big Dream and a Bad Team. A big dream and a bad team. Joseph was a dreamer, you all. He was a dreamer, and he he had some brothers who were jealous of him. And I'm going to get to family in just a second. But I want to first talk to you about the dream that he had. Because we don't have all that time this morning to go through this whole story of Joseph. But Joseph had a dream that they would bow down, metaphorically speaking, that they would bow down to him and he would be in charge. And Joseph was excited about the dream, and Joseph told his brothers and his father about the dream. And they just couldn't believe it. And Joseph's dreams were the reason that they conspired against him to kill him. Of course, his father gave him a coat of many colors, a Louis Vuitton maybe compared to today. Right, a Da Vinci coat maybe compared to today. A Pelly coat maybe compared to today. <laughs> so they were jealous of him because of that. But when he told them the dream, that's when things started to change. You see, when you have a big dream and you have a big purpose and you realize it, be careful who you surround yourself with. Be careful who you surround. Your team plays a big part in your success. You only go as far as the people you hang around for no reason. Amen, somebody. My, my, my grandmother said, if you got five broke friends, you're going to be the sixth broke friend. <laughs> Amen. Big dream, bad team. One thing Joseph did, he talked too much. We can keep it real in here. Sometimes you have to keep your mouth shut until things materialize. You can, you, cause sometimes when you speak things too soon, you don't know who is conspiring against you. You don't know who is praying that you don't succeed. Sometimes it's just best to keep, after all, the Bible does say, be swift to hear and slow to speak. So be careful what you open up your mouth about too soon. We know it's going to happen. We know you're excited. Just keep quiet. It's on the way. It's on the way. Let me tell you something else. Your potential. When you wake up to your potential, that's when you become a threat. Some of our greatest leaders were assassinated because they had potential and they were, they, they, they were awakened to their dreams and the potential that they had to change the world. Joseph didn't have any money. Joseph didn't have any power. Joseph didn't have any prestige, but they plotted to kill him because of his potential. There are some people who can see your potential greater than you can. There are some people who can look at you and see how far you can go clearer than you can. And so when you have your dreams and you realize your potential, that's when you become the biggest threat. Yes, sir. Talk to you. you must be careful who you surround yourself with when you wake up. See, a lot of people sleep. All right. Yeah, we walking dead, some of us. <laughs> we just sleep. But when you wake up, be careful who you surround yourself with. 
I want you to see in this text that Joseph's family did this to him. Yeah, 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 yeah. This was his blood. They tried to kill him because of a dream. His blood brothers. Can I talk about family for a second? Can I talk about family for a second? Sometimes family will do you worse than people in the world. Sometimes family will treat you worse than somebody who don't even know you. As a matter of fact, it is a saying that says your biggest hater is somebody close to you and your biggest admirer is somebody you don't even know. It was his blood brothers who conspired against him to kill him because of a dream, y'all. And he was looking for them. How about that? I'm going to tell y'all something this morning. Stop looking for people who ain't looking for you. Stop looking for people. Jo- Joseph was looking for his family more than his family was looking for him. All right. All right. How many of us in here are running after behind family members who don't want nothing to do with us? But we keep calling. But we keep showing up. But we keep trying to be. But we keep trying to get included. Joseph was the same way. And God had to remove Joseph from his family because Joseph wouldn't have removed himself. And sometimes God will remove you from hindrances. Because God's will will be done. You can you can do it the easy way or you can do it the hard way. But God's will will always be done. Joseph was sold as James Brown said, he sold him out for chicken change. <laughs> all of, all because, all because of a dream, brothers and sisters. All right, talk to him. Man, 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 there's so much in here. There's so much in here. But I want to, I want to let you know, family, family is, you got to watch family sometimes, y'all. Uh, you think about your biggest heartbreak. Your first fight, your first argument, your first letdown, it was probably with a family member. Family members sometimes can show us the cruelties that the world possesses. Before we get there, family members prepare us for it. And I'm not saying don't love your family, but we have to find a balance, y'all. Sometimes we're giving too much and giving God too less. You aren't even stepping up and walking into your maximum potential because of family. God is a jealous God, even when it comes to family. I want you to go over Genesis chapter 45 and I'll land this plane. Genesis chapter 45, just wait there for me. Genesis chapter 45. While you're going there, because there's so much in this text, this could be a series. But for the sake of time, I want to talk about moments. Because moments are powerful, brothers and sisters. Moments are meaningful, impactful experiences. Short, meaningful, impactful experiences. But short is relative. Short for me may be a month. Short for you may be a year. Short is relative. But the, but, but don't underestimate how powerful a moment is. Moments come in peaks and moments come in pits. You, you see, see, But in whatever situation, whether you're in a peak or a pit, use that moment to elevate your life. You see, Joseph has some moments, y'all. He went from the pit to prison to the palace. And he was wrongfully convicted when he went to prison. And he spent some time in there for a woman. Praise the mighty name of Jesus. For something that he did not do. But I want you to see, before we get to Genesis chapter 45, in every moment that Joseph had, he used it to elevate his life. And in every moment Joseph learned from from, from whatever he was in. One thing I can appreciate about the text is Joseph never complained in any situation he was in. When you read Genesis 37 through 45, the Bible says, and the Lord was with him. And the Lord was with him. That should let somebody know in here this morning, that no matter where you are right now, the Lord is with you. Use that moment. 
use that moment. I don't know who needs to hear this. It doesn't matter how dark it is right now. It doesn't matter how low you are right now. Use that moment because God is with you. You know, Jesus says, abide in me. And I in you. And I'll make you fruitful. But you know, that word abide is synonymous to remain. So I want to talk to somebody real quick. Remain in the Lord. In what I don't care whatever capacity you're in. I don't care where you go. I don't care how your, your life changes. Remain in the Lord. And he will make you fruitful. That means if you're in the pit, as long as you're remaining in the Lord, he'll make you fruitful. If you're in prison, as long as you're remaining in the Lord, he'll make you fruitful. You're in a bad marriage, as long as you're remaining in the Lord, he'll make you fruitful. Y'all ain't going to talk to me this morning. You're in a bad relationship, as long as you're remaining in the Lord, he'll make you fruitful. You're in a bad job, as long as you're remaining in the Lord. You see, sometimes we think we got to jump from here to there to there to there, when really all you got to do is abide. Joseph had moments that defined his character. And in each moment, God was building his character. Meaningful, impactful experiences. Let me just say this and I'll move on. Since uh, COVID happened, um, I've been trying to be the healthiest man on the world in the world. My wife will tell you, I, I've been eating asparagus and quinoa and a lot of stuff, y'all. But I bought, I, and I got this organic store next to my apartment. And I go in there all sedity sometimes. <laughs> and I buy my good apples and oranges and stuff. But listen, I buy this uh, concoction. It's, it's, it's apple cider vinegar. Amen, somebody. <laughs> apple cider vinegar. See, see, some of the seasoned people in here know about that apple cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar, uh, honey, and ginger. It's in one bottle. So I buy that, and then uh, I put it in my water, and I'm off. <laughs> right? But on the bottle, it says, yes, shake. The best stuff is at the bottom. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> sometime God got to shake your life up and send you down to the bottom level. Anybody ain't ever been on the bottom level? Anybody ain't know about that bottom level when nobody understands you? You can't talk to nobody. You can't cry to nobody without being judged or looked at or frowned upon. I'm talking about the bottom. Say, yeah, the best stuff is at the bottom because God knows when you come up out of the bottom, you're going to submerge and emerge a different person. But you're not, see, this pandemic... Some of us will be the same after this. Some of us going to be completely different. But in whatever case, I'm trying to tell you that the best version of yourself can sometimes come when you're in a pit. Because pits can teach you something that hilltops can never show you. It's when you're down bad, down on your luck. It's when you, it's when you emerge the bad. And God knows that. So I want to tell somebody in here this morning, doesn't matter how low it is, no matter how low you are, things are about to get better. They're about to get better. And you got to use this as a stepping stool. And even if you're higher right now, keep on stepping. Let the church say amen. Let me close this up here. Uh, Genesis chapter 45. Y'all there? Genesis chapter 45. Um, Joseph at this time... He runs into his brothers again. And he recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. But at this time, Joseph is the governor of Egypt. In other words, his dream came true. And right here is a very, 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 very important part of this entire text. If you can get Genesis 45, you can get this story about Joseph. Genesis 45, beginning at verse number 1, the Bible says, Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? 
But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, please, please, come near me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years, the famine has been in the land, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me here before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. Listen to this here, y'all. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and the ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. God got a sense of humor. Let's start there. God really has a sense of humor. <laughs> they tried to take his life. And when they thought they were taking his life, God was saving theirs. And Joseph went in the pit. And Joseph was sold to people who did not know him. And Joseph had to do time in jail. All to just come back around. All to just bring things back around. Full circle. Here go my family again. And you know, before I say anything else, I want to point out here. Sometimes you can't be the biggest of help when you're in the thick of it. Y'all know what I'm saying? I mean, when you, when you're in the thick of it, it's hard because you're struggling too. So sometimes you gotta let God take you up another octave so you can rise a bit. Ain't nothing wrong with, ain't nothing, see, in the church of Christ, sometimes we act like we can't rise. We are peculiar people, but we ain't strange. God wants us to have the best of the best of the best, but sometimes you gotta let God take you there. So that then you can realize and you can just see things as they, as Brother Atwater says, as they are. You can see life as it is, not how you want it to be. And you can be a bigger help to your family and your friend. You see, sometimes we're trying to help prematurely. Not saying that. Not saying that you can't. But the bigger impact that you really want to achieve, sometimes you got to remove yourself a while. So that you can rise. Because when you rise, you can realize you can see things for what they are. But God has a sense of humor, y'all. Can I talk to the black sheep in the family? Any black sheep in the family? I was a black sheep in my family. Yeah, I want to talk to the ones that they counted out when you were growing up. The ones that they said you weren't going to be, and they laughed about you. Talk about my family. They talked about you. They called you funny names. They said, you know, yeah, I want to talk to the black sheep in the family. But somehow, some kind of way, now, the tables have turned. And God has positioned you now to be the driving force of that family that counted you out. And you know what now? When you look at it, it don't even bother you no more. That's the goodness of God, y'all. God can take some of that hatred out your heart over time and replace it with nothing but love. Sometimes I'm telling y'all, and I'm about to close, God has to send you ahead of the storm. You don't know what's coming. Only God knows. And he has to send you ahead of the problem so that you can be of better use when the real famine hits the land. Joseph was sent ahead of the problem and Joseph said, you know what? I'm not even mad at you all. And I don't want you all to be mad at me. But is my father still alive? Because it wasn't you who sent me here. It was God who sent me here. Brothers and sisters, God is trying to send you somewhere in your life. How long are you going to fight against it? Because you holding on to family ties. You holding on to friendships. You holding on to things. God is just, and you know, Jesus told Paul, it is not wise to kick against the pricks. 
Didn't he tell him that, brother Edward? Yes. When Jesus met Paul, he said, what are you doing? It, you're going against the grain. How many of us are going against the grain and God is trying to send you ahead of the storm? If you're in here this morning and you need to be baptized, brothers and sisters, wherever you are, today is the day. <clears throat> Don't run no more. Time, you got more time behind you than you do in front of you. Today is the day. If you want to be baptized, you come up here now. Don't put it off for nobody. Don't put it off for nothing. We don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. You come up here now so you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And if you are here this morning and you need some prayer because you got a purpose and you know you got a purpose, but you having a hard time fighting, fighting family and fighting friend. But you know you got a purpose, though. But it's just hard for you to let it go. Let them go. You got to give them to God, y'all. So you can be the best version of yourself. And if you're having a hard time with that, we're going to pray for you. If your situation, whatever your situation is, is straining on your heart, we're going to pray for you. This morning, today, big dream and a bad team. As I close, be careful who you talk to. Yes, sir. Be careful who you share your dreams with. Yeah, yeah. Take advantage of these moments. Create them if you can. Let me tell you something. When people die, all you're going to have is the moments you left that you had with them. So if you don't make no moments, you won't have no memories. Amen. Make those moments count. Some people say seize the moment. Make them count. Use them to elevate your life and yourself. And don't fight God's plan. Go with the flow. When I met my wife, she told me, just go with the flow. (laughs) I've been going with the flow ever since. So we're again pleased to be able to have this Windy City Lectureship. During the past years, we've had some great lectureships with themes such as the lily and the tulip. Uh, We've discussed where have all the prophets gone. We've discussed the upper room discourse where we dealt with the last night of our Lord and Savior in that upper room before he went to Calvary. Last year we were excited to build our theme around the subject when the trumpet is expected the flute will not suffice. Great sermons were given in in regards to that theme and Again, I want to thank Dr. Stephen Thompson, who did a magnificent job with a subject that we gave him entitled, Due to Technical Difficulties, Tomorrow Has Been Canceled. And Dr. Thompson did an outstanding job in relation to that topic. Well, let me say also that in past lectureships, we um, had incorporated a roundtable discussion where we dealt with various uh, issues, exegesis, exegetical issues, biblical issues, theological issues, as well as apologetic issues in reference to the Word of God. Now this year, we chose not to go that avenue, but uh, we are still looking forward to having a great time in listening to these men of God proclaim the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. If you go on Facebook, you will find a link. It is a flipbook link where you can click on that link and access the program. There is a pictorial directory of ministers, both past and present, from 1916 through 2021, inclusive in that program book. You will find the names of each speaker, the dates, and the days of which they will be speaking and other information relative to this outstanding theme, a journey with Joseph. May God keep you. He wants whatever he wants from me. He He can ask of me and I. For you, 
and oh, I, I want to give. I'm trying to give like you. I want to be able to give you've like done you. So much. You've done so much for me. For me. Hey. You've done so much for you've me. Done so much. You've done so much for me. For me. And whoa, whoa, that's why I want to live for you. I I wanna work for you. I wanna work for you. I wanna give like you. I wanna give like you. I wanna be like you. I wanna be like you. And I wanna give for you. I wanna give for you. I wanna live for you. Ryan C. Jones, Senior Minister of the Newburgh Church of Christ here in beautiful Louisville, Kentucky. I just want to express my profound appreciation for Dr. David Penn and the Chicago area Churches of Christ and all the great gospel preachers in that area for extending me the opportunity to be able to preach and teach the word of God. The title to today's teaching is I'm Coming Out. I hope and pray that you're blessed by the word. May God bless you. Beloved, it was African-American author, filmmaker, and anthropologist Zora Neale Hurston who was first coined and credited with saying, all my skin folk ain't kin folk, which is a powerful statement that shatters the belief that because someone looks like you and you share the same biology, and geography, it doesn't mean that you share the same ideology and theology. I stopped by today to say, suggest, and yea, submit to some of you that some of the worst pain that you will ever experience in your life won't just originate from your friends and fake and phony people on your job, but some of the worst pain will come from among your family, your blood relatives who share the same DNA and blood and the same physical address as you. So as we jaywalk today through this journey found in Genesis chapter 37 all the way down to Genesis chapter 50, I want to bring a man in the Bible by the name of Joseph to the sermonic stage. Now, I don't want you to worry about it, beloved, because I think those of you who've been through some things in your life can actually relate to this man named Joseph. I know that's right because maybe many of you have been hurt by people that you've helped, let down by people that you've loved, disappointed by people that you actually appointed and you have an infection of rejection so you can relate to Joseph. Beloved, when you notice Genesis chapter number 39 and verse 1 through 3, the Bible says these words, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Here's the part that'll make you run. Verse number two, the Lord was with Joseph. Yeah. Yeah. So he became a successful man and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. Beloved, if I had to tag this teaching with a simple title, it would simply be, I'm coming out. If you're online right now, go ahead and type that in the section right now. I'm coming out. And if I had time, I would give you a subtitle to this teaching. And the subtitle would simply be, The Lord is with me. The Lord is with me. So if you've been in your life in the pits before, I want to use this pulpit today to do my best to pull you out of this pit. And I want you to understand that the first thing that we notice in this journey with Joseph 
is Joseph's dream. Somebody type that in. Joseph's dream. We find in Genesis chapter number 37, verses 5 through 9, we pick up when Joseph was 17 years old. He was the son of Jacob, and he was gifted and talented and had a great relationship with his father. But Joseph was a dreamer, watch this, who shared his dreams with his brothers who were jealous of him and they hated him and they were envious of him. Do I have anybody out there today that has some haters oh, right. <laughs> in your life? We learn from Joseph that you have to be careful who you share your dreams with. Never share your big dreams with people, catch this, who have small minds. Too many dreams and plans have been assassinated before they were ever activated. So Joseph's brothers saw him and they hated him because when they saw Joseph, it revealed something in Joseph within themselves that they wanted to see within their own lives because their own insufficiencies, their own insecurities were exposed when they saw Joseph because Joseph was in the gifted and talented program and his daddy knew that Joseph was going to be a powerful man so his brothers couldn't stand him and they were his own family. And so now we want to understand Joseph's drama. Type that in for me, beloved. Joseph's drama. So his brothers decided to persecute him. The idea of persecution means to aggressively and violently pursue someone with the intent to pose harm, hurt, or danger against him. So his brothers concocted this plan to plot against their brother and they threw him into the pit. They threw Joseph, their own brother, into the pit. And then while Joseph is in the pit, no doubt yelling and screaming to his blood brothers to let him out. He didn't deserve to be in there. This was a trick, a game that they should not have played. They were eating a meal while Joseph was hollering and screaming. Because sometimes the people who are closest to you are the ones that the devil will use to do you in. I wish I had somebody out there on today. So they pro pro persecuted him, threw him uh, into the pit, and they plotted against him. Now they decided not to kill him, but what happened was they sold him to the Ishmaelites. They sold their brother. Let me come home. They human trafficked mm. their brother for some money. And not only that, the reason why they did it was because they couldn't stand their younger brother, Joseph. I told you that there's some people that will be envious and jealous of you because Joseph was a dreamer. And the reason why his brothers could not stand him was because his dreams elevated him over his brothers. Not only that, his dreams elevated him over his brothers and his mother and father. And any time you share your dreams and you are elevated among your family and your friends and folks on your job and folks in your church, People won't stand you. They won't like it because nobody wants to see you be elevated above them. Nobody wants to work as hard as you had to work. Nobody wants to maintain the level of integrity that you have and build the relationship. So they don't want to do that. So they want to bring you down. Is there anybody out there that's been brought down by something somebody said? Brought down by something somebody did? And all the while you were not even in the wrong and they were and you end up suffering the punishment. I hope I'm speaking to somebody who has some dreams uh, out there on today and somebody who is going through some drama uh, in your life. So the Bible teaches and tells us before he was sold into slavery that they stripped Joseph of his coat, you know that very colored tunic, this colorful garment that his father Jacob had given him because he loved him. And I stopped by to tell somebody on today, beloved, for those of you who are worshiping, 
or witnessing and watching that sometimes your haters want to strip you of your glory strip you of your dignity your confidence uh, and your joy but I don't know about you if you know that God is going to bless your life you want to open up your mouth or type in the comment section right now I'm coming out I'm coming out I'm coming out they can put me in the pit all they want but I'm coming out why brother Jones because the Lord is with you and though your enemies and haters plot and scheme against you and put you in the pit what they don't know is that God has a trampoline at the bottom of the pit yep. to help you bounce back up in your life. There's a button in the elevator that's going up to the top floor when the enemies of your life want to see you on the bottom basement floor. God can bring you up. Yeah. Okay. But what's yeah. going to help you come out of your pit is a few things that we can learn from Joseph's life. See, my brothers and sisters, Joseph had drive. So now I want to talk to you about Joseph's drive. I've given you Joseph's dream, Joseph's drama. Now I want to talk to you about Joseph's drive. Because if God is going to indeed elevate you beyond where you are right now, you can't give up on your dreams. You can't allow the drama that's going on in your life because you optically see drama that cause you to think that God is no longer interested in elevating you to use you for his purpose. So we find that Joseph, my friends, is now being sold by his brothers to the Ishmaelites and he, he had to go down to Egypt and there he was purchased by Potiphar, a captain of Pharaoh's bodyguard down in Egypt. But I want you to know something when God has a plan and a calling over your life. I pray you can receive this one today. I need you to know that God was with Joseph. Yeah. Yeah. And when God is with you, despite your shattered dreams, despite your drama, God can always bless everything that you touch. Yeah. See, Joseph was like MJ in the 90s. Kobe in the 2000s, LeBron and Kevin Durant right now, whenever he touched the ball, it was going to drop. Whenever they threw him a pitch, it was a home run. Whenever they threw him a pass, it was a touchdown because God was with him. And no matter what you go through right now, even in the midst of this pitiful, painful, perilous pandemic, I need somebody to know that if God is with you, God can bless your efforts and bless the works of your hands and bless what you do. Can't nobody tear you down, even though you're going through some stuff in your life. Why? Because the Lord was with him. So Joseph was driven to live a godly life despite his circumstances. And I don't know if you know it or not, but what I just said was powerful because God still can use you despite your circumstances. Yep. So now Joseph finds himself with his masters, uh, in his master's house. And in his master's house, his master was Potiphar. And now he's working and the only issue is he's working in his master's house and it's just him and his master's wife. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter number 39 that Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. He was a pretty boy. Sounds like he was a member of Kappa Alpha Psi fraternity. Incorporated. Let me move on. Y'all pray for me. Amen. Now, Potiphar's wife was thirsty, as the young people say. Yeah, she saw Joseph was a handsome man. And the Bible says that she asked Joseph, Joseph, lie with me. Uh, don't get quiet on me now. Yeah, she was sexually ready to go. And Joseph was a man of integrity because what drove Joseph was not 
just his current circumstances. What drove Joseph was his relationship with God. So no matter where Joseph was, no matter where he was that he did not want to be, Joseph was not going to do anything that would mess up his relationship with God. He was driven by obedience. He was driven by knowing that God was with him. He was driven by the fact that he had hope expectation, anticipation that if I'm faithful to God God will be with me, I will be with him, he will live my life I gotta stay in my faith stay with God and I gotta keep doing what I know God wants me to do because one day God will elevate me and that's Joseph's posture so he told part of his wife the only thing that's in my charge is what my master, your husband has given me to do and how could I do this great evil and sin against God? So Joseph was like Usain Bolt. He grabbed his track shoes and he ran out of there. But she kept, the Bible says every day she kept asking him, Joseph, lie with me on Sunday after Bible class and worship. Joseph, lie with me on Monday. Joseph, lie with me every day of the week. Joseph, lie with me. Joseph got his track shoes, ran out of the house and she caught his garment. And when her husband came home, she lied on Joseph and said that he tried to make a sport out of her. So now Joseph's master put him in prison. So Joseph is being locked up in jail because he was falsely accused by a woman that he would refuse to sleep with because of its integrity. So what are you saying, Brother Jones? If you want to come out of your pit, you have to maintain your spiritual integrity. Y'all catch that on today? Maintain your spiritual integrity integrity so now she uh placed joseph in jail because joseph would not lie on her she lied on him because he wouldn't lie with her can i say that one more time she lied on him because he wouldn't lie with her and i need you to know that by the time we find joseph locked up in jail all because of maintaining his integrity we find that there were two prisoners locked up in jail with Joseph. One of them was Pharaoh's chief baker and the cupbearer. The chief baker and the cupbearer. But I want you to know that while he's locked up, knowing that he's been falsely accused, doing a bid over something that he did not even do. I wish I had time. Now he finds that the chief cupbearer and the baker have some long faces. And so he asked them why they were in jail, what was wrong with them. And so what they did was they told Joseph that they had some dreams that they were not able to interpret. And Joseph let them know, don't all dreams belong to God? Tell it to me. Because Joseph had a special relationship with God and he had the gift of being a dreamer and the gift of interpretation. So he gave the interpretation of the dreams of those two other prisoners of Pharaoh. One of them had a positive interpretation and the other one, the chief baker, had a negative interpretation. So when he interpreted the dreams, all Joseph told those that one uh, brother who was a chief cupbearer was, when you get restored to your position, just remember me. But guess what? You know the story. The man forgot about him. But here's what I want to tell you if you need to come out right now. Despite his adversity, Joseph used his gifts to help people despite his adversity. Did you catch that? Yeah. I said that Joseph, brothers and sisters, used his gifts despite the adversity that he went through. And let me pause parenthetically and throw this in the preaching gumbo while I make my rule. Here it is. When God gets ready to elevate you, God will allow a problem to exist <laughs> that only you have the gift to fix. Are y'all in this place on the day? I want you to catch this. That's why you got to make sure you know you coming out, but there's some things you're going to have to do. You have to be driven like Joseph to do the right thing before God because God was still with him. See what God can do, beloved? God will allow a problem to exist that you, that the only person that knows and has the gift to fix it 
is you remember the dreams of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. He had the gift to be able to interpret their dreams to fix a problem that they had. Therefore, two years later, Pharaoh has a dream. And the problem with Pharaoh's dream is Pharaoh does not know the interpretation. So God gave Pharaoh a dream and the chief cupbearer and the chief baker a dream. What are you doing, God? I'm giving folks problems. <laughs> that the only person that can fix them is you. So God knows how to elevate you more than just what you think he can do. God has a plethora of different ways to get you to the next level in your life. You better give God some praise on today. Amen. Amen. I just need somebody to understand. That's why we have to focus on using our gift. All right? We need to focus on using our gift because it's never about uh, how we want to use our gift. It's always about, catch this, it's going to bless your life. It's always about how, where, and when God wants to use your gift. Yep. Because many people are frustrated every day because we want to use our gift when we want to use our gift the way we want to use our gift. And we're frustrated when we can't use our gift when and how and where we want to use it. But it was never about when you want to use yeah. your gift. It was yeah. always about when God wants you to use your gift and how God wants to use your gift and where God wants yeah. to use yeah, that's right. your gifts. So brothers and sisters, I want to tell somebody on today that when Pharaoh had that dream long uh, before Martin Luther King Jr., Pharaoh had a dream, pray for me. Yeah. And yeah, man, uh, Pharaoh was perplexed and he had a dream. You know the story about the seven skinny cows and the seven fat cows. And, and, and they found out that Joseph was one who could interpret dreams because the chief cupbearer said that he knew that there was a young Hebrew man that had interpreted his dream two years prior and he told Pharaoh that uh, he can help you out too, Pharaoh. That's why it always pays and it's important to use your gift because you never know who you can help that will tell somebody, that will tell somebody, that will tell somebody that you have a gift that they may need at that time. It meant somebody. So I want somebody out there to know when Pharaoh brought Joseph in, they had to take him to the barber shop, uh, take him down the soup supply and get a soup. And he came and stood before Pharaoh and he interpreted Pharaoh's dream. And uh, the Bible teaches and tells us that once he did that, he let Pharaoh know that you're going to need somebody who has a financial plan and scheme to save some of the abundance in the seven years of abundance uh, when there's going to be seven years of famine in the land. And Pharaoh couldn't find nobody else uh, like Joseph because the Bible says that the Lord was with him. So Pharaoh decided to elevate Joseph and promote him to being second in command over all of Jesus. I don't know about you, but it sounds like God blessed Joseph to come out. Amen, somebody. Amen. I don't know about you. You need to give God praise if you just believe that you're about to come out. You're about to come out. You're about to come out of depression, come out of anxiety, come out of financial woes. You're going to help somebody and maintain your spiritual integrity. So Joseph was elevated, Genesis 41, 41. And I need you to know that the last time that Joseph saw his brothers, they had stripped him <laughs> of his clothes. They stripped him of his garments. But since there was a famine in the land, we find that Joseph's family came down to Egypt because they needed some food. They needed some grain. And so when Joseph was ruler oh, man. in Egypt, they had to stand before Joseph. Remember when he was 17 and he was dreaming about how his brothers were going to bow down <laughs> to him and how his parents would to the sun and the moon. Amen, somebody. And now it is finally coming to fruition, but they don't recognize Joseph. Because now he's adapted to the culture of the Egyptians. And we find in Genesis chapter 45, in verse number four, I want to read this to you on today. It's going to bless your life. I want you to see this. The Bible says, 
I want you to notice this. Then Joseph said to his brothers, when they came down for grain, watch this now. The Bible says, then Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer to me. And they came closer and said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Can I tell you something before I move on to explain this passage? That when God gets ready to elevate you, the people who stripped you previously, the people who plotted against you previously, the people who persecuted you and wanted to sell you off because they couldn't stand you, those same people, when they see you after God elevates you, they won't recognize you. <laughs> oh, God. That's why he had to say, come closer. Because from afar, they didn't even know that there was their brother that they plotted and planned to place in a pit and sold down to Egypt land. Amen. Verse number five, beloved, here it is. He said, now, now this is, this is why I love Joseph, because he has this kind of spirit that's so motivated. It's so spiritual. It's so connected to God. You can tell that Joseph spent time with God. Yeah. Verse number five, beloved, I want you to see this. Now, do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Yeah. Can I tell you, Joseph was a spiritual man. Joseph told his brothers, no matter what you've done to me, I have now matured in my life. And now I see that hindsight is 2020 and what God was ultimately trying to do with all of the drama that I had to go through when I had those big dreams. And since I've been driven to follow God, no matter what I go through, because I know that God is with me, I now know that it was God using what you were doing to me to place me in a position to impact people's lives so that I can preserve life. And I think that's powerful because it's interesting to note that previously they did him so dirty, many of us would not be able to stand in front of the same people, mm -hmm. our family members that did us so dirty because we just couldn't get beyond the hurt and the pain that they caused us so Joseph took a step on the spiritual ladder and went higher with God. And I want to pause, park, and preach here real quick to tell somebody out there today that even though they stripped Joseph of, the, of his clothes before, they couldn't strip him of his character. That's right. Because the Lord was with him. And not only that, God is a God of restoration. Everything they stripped you of, every job they stripped you of, every relationship you got stripped of, every check you got stripped of every time you should have been elevated but they stripped you of it God can restore everything they stripped from you and I want you to know that when they saw Joseph this time he had on some better clothes than what his father gave him oh, can't you see him with his Louis Vuitton <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> with his Gucci him and somebody right. Joseph is decked out Ralph Lauren man he oh. got it going Steve St. Laurent he got everything because God elevated him and I wish I had time to, but I have to hasten here, but it was say it was two times that the devil used clothes or garments to lie on Joseph. Wow. The first time his brothers lied to his father that he was dead and brought back the coat to his father and said that a wild beast had devoured him, killed the goat, and put the blood of the goat on the coat and gave it to his father ironically which is the same thing that his father and his mother concocted Jacob and his mother concocted against his brother Esau I just don't have time on today the second time they used clothes to lie on Joseph was when Potiphar's wife his master's wife lied on Joseph after she snatched his garment from him and told her husband that he tried to do something with her after he ran away and I want to say this real quick as I get ready to hasten the clothes here be careful how you treat people because you may need them yeah. <laughs> before they need you. Yeah. And let me just tell you what's going to happen after you come out and I'll take my seat. Notice your Bible, Genesis chapter 50 and verse number 20. Genesis chapter 50, beloved, and verse number 20. I got to go. The Bible says, notice what Joseph said. I want to slow it down so you can get it. Mm -hmm. As for you, you meant evil against me. 
Could you imagine how much time and Bible reading and prayer that you would have to spend with God to mature to the point where the very same people who cost you 13 years of your life, you can look at them and tell them what you meant uh, as evil against me. Watch this. God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. He says, what you meant as for you, you meant evil. When you plotted against me, you meant me evil. When you persecuted me to snatch uh, my garment off of my back and place me in the pit, you meant evil. When I was placed in prison as I was falsely accused of and lied on, you meant evil against me. People in Joseph's life did him wrong, but he said what you meant for evil, watch this, God had a different meaning for what Joseph was going through. God meant it for good <clears throat> because God had a purpose for Joseph's pain. Yep, yeah. Can I tell somebody out there that's going through pain because you've been done wrong, you've been lied on, and you want to come out of this pit that you're in right now, you just maintain your spiritual integrity, continue to use your gifts, because you never know who God is going to allow a problem that only you could fix. Yeah. That's why you have to be driven like Joseph to follow God despite your circumstances. Amen. And I want you to know when he says that um, God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Some of the people that God wanted to preserve alive was Joseph's own brothers because there was indeed a promise, even though they didn't have it back then, if you were to go to Ancestry.com and look up Joseph's ancestors. There was a man by the name of Abraham that God gave a promise that in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. God gave that same promise to Abraham's son Isaac and then Isaac had a son by the name of Jacob which was Joseph's father and Jacob had 12 sons. We call them the 12 tribes of Israel and one of those sons was carrying the promise that God was going to use to bring forth the Messiah Jesus Christ so God sent Joseph down there to Egypt land to use it for good to preserve his own family because there was one of his brothers that God was going to use by the name of Judah and Judah we find slept with a woman named Tamar who was Posing as a prostitute has twins, Perez and Zerah, and God raised up Perez uh, and, and Zerah, and Perez had a son by the name of Ezron, and Ezron had a son by the name of Ram, and Ram had a son by the name of Aminadab, and Aminadab had a son by the name of Nashon, Nashon had a son by the name of Salmon, Salmon had a son by the name of Boaz, Boaz had a son by the name of Obed, Obed had a son by the name of Jesse, Jesse had a son by the name of King David, and through the loins and lines of King David came forth another man by the name of Jesus Christ, who went through some stuff and some pits in his life, but he maintained his spiritual integrity, used his gift to help and heal people and never hurt them despite his adversity and then God elevated Jesus when he died on the cross with the crucifixion and he raised him from the dead after three days because yeah. God can bring you up I'm done there was a Martin Luther King Jr. quote I want to give you we must accept finite disappointment but never lose infinite hope if you're in the pit right now beloved here's what I want to tell you keep your dreams alive don't never give up on your dreams. No matter who tries to assassinate your dreams, never give up on them. If you know that God gave them to you and you have a spiritual purpose to use your dream that God gave you to elevate God. Secondly, don't worry about the drama that you may have to go through. Joseph was 17, but then he ended up being 30 before God lifted him and elevated him. That 13 years of his life, he went through hell and drama, but he maintained his spiritual integrity because he was driven to honor God and to honor God's will and God's word and God's way. And if you do that, you're coming out of this pit bigger, better, stronger, and better and not bitter because God can position you to help somebody to preserve many people alive. Thank yeah. God for Jesus Christ, Amen. the messianic master, and all that he has done to preserve us alive for eternity. We thank God for the person of Christ 
in this journey with Joseph because it teaches us that God will come through on his promises like he's always done before. So we give God praise. I don't know about you. I'm coming out of this. May God bless you. Amen. Somebody found peace like a river. Yes, somebody's breakthrough. Y'all, it's coming in. Oh, somebody's cup is running over. They told me that they're drinking from the saucer. Don't worry, another blessing is surely on the way. And you just say hallelujah for somebody else this time. Now you may be going through troubles and trials right now And it may seem like there's no end in sight But I know a God who takes care of his own Yes sir, and he promised he'd never, never leave you alone But first you gotta trust him and learn how to give it to him And get out of the way and let him move his way and then you can have peace <laughs> like a river you can tell somebody your breakthrough you can see it's coming in oh and your cup is overflowing and then you know what it means to be drinking from the saucer don't worry god's not through he sees you too and he's got a blessing with your name on it Believe me now, somebody's sick today and can't get well And for somebody right now, life is a living hell But I know a God, and He specializes in whatever you need He can provide it, I tell you, you can trust Him If you'd only give it to and give it up and turn it loose and let it move like that river you can tell somebody their breakthrough is surely coming in and just like the others their cup is gonna run over and pretty soon they'll be drinking from that saucer but god's still not finished he's still in the blessing business so raise your hand and say hallelujah for somebody else Somebody's cup, y'all, is running over and they're drinking, drinking from the saucer. No, God's not retired. He still sits on high and he's looking down. He's keeping track and that's a fact. Hey, another blessing is surely on the way. But if it's not yours, can you rejoice for somebody else? Because God still got a blessing. Greetings. I'd like to say to 
this listening audience, we are so thankful for the privilege, for the opportunity to be a part of the 12th annual Windy City Lectureship. And while we recognize the pandemic has caused us to have to alter our plans and approach this virtually, we are nonetheless excited by those who will be participants and able to be a part of this great endeavor. I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Penn, Dr. Harrison, and all of those who labor to put this Windy City Lectureship uh, together. This year's theme is most appropriate, a journey with Joseph as found in the book of Genesis. Uh, so many riches that can bless us and so many things that can be deposited in our spirit to help us in these times. I am thankful and honored to have been chosen as one of the speakers and I hope to say something that will bless you and something that will help you in the days to come. I am most honored to be on program with other great gospel preachers and I'm excited for their messages and hope that they will offer something that will bless you as well. I like to take as a text Genesis chapter 50. While you're turning to Genesis chapter 50, I give greetings to you on behalf of the Gateway Community Church of Christ in St. Louis, Missouri, where I am privileged to serve as the minister, and we certainly commend to all of this listening audience our love, care, and concern for you, especially in these times. Genesis chapter 50, and if you will meet me at verse number 15. Genesis chapter 50, beginning with verse 15. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, so shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God. But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. In keeping with the objectives of this, the 12th annual Windy City Lectureship, the message for this presentation is healing hurts that don't want to heal. Healing hurts that don't want to heal. Now, if you have never been hurt, if you have never been betrayed, if you have never suffered wrong at the hands of someone, this message will offer no benefits to you. But if you know, like I know, if you can relate to Joseph and to practically everyone else who knows what it's like to be hurt 
and in need of healing, and yet finding yourself unable in above your own accord to heal those hurts, there is a word from the Lord. Joseph stands out to students of the scripture for many reasons. As the beloved son of Israel, also known as Jacob, he had his father's unquestionable love and certainly his daddy's approval. The coat of many colors, for example, symbolizes the favor and preference that his father had given him in contrast to his brothers. We can also recall his prominent position in Potiphar's house, as recorded in Genesis 39 verses 4 and 5, he was promoted to an overseer. The Lord God blessed him to be able to interpret Pharaoh's dream, and that brought him even more favor. Pharaoh set him over all of the land of Egypt. He gave him his reign to wear. Pharaoh dressed Joseph in fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck, according to Genesis 41, verses 41 through 43. From all appearances, Joseph's life demonstrates one blessing after another. However, interwoven between these periods of highs and times of considerable lows, there were some headaches and some heartaches. Though privileged, Joseph's life was not without pain. He had to come to understand an uncomfortable truth that all living men and women will ultimately understand that at some point for every human creature, the experience of innocence will be shattered by a painful episode of hurt betrayal and mistreatment. There is much glory to speak about in Joseph's life, but one must not look at the dramatic stories and not come to understand that that glory was also matched with some story. We look at these dramatic stories and can easily dismiss them in favor of pursuing the glory. But we must understand the story so that we can better appreciate his glory. Like our own experiences, Joseph's agony and frustration were compounded by the fact that he did nothing to invite the problems that plagued him. He was only guilty of being young and ambitious. He was only guilty of being a dreamer. And that ambitious spirit was met with envy and jealousy from those closest to him. And it is one thing for some foreign enemy to upset you. It is one thing for some foreign enemy to be an agitator that aggravates you, but Joseph was bewildered by his own brethren. It was the mistreatment of those close to him, those who shared his blood. It is a rather confusing circumstance. It is a disturbing dilemma when your emotions become exhausted by the betrayal of someone close to you. How do we contend with such deep pain? And how can we reconcile within ourselves the notion of loving others when we have been hated so much? What motivation can we fathom in esteeming others? 
when we have been greatly despised? Has the question ever been answered, how can you mend a broken heart? How do we heal hurts that don't want to heal? Allow me to take you to the text and show you some means by which we find healing. Healing that may not necessarily be found in a doctor's office or in a prescription. Healing that may not be found in a bank account, a credit score, or some semblance of man's sense of an asset in his own life. We must make an appeal to the Father. We must make an appeal to forgiveness and we must make an appeal to our focus. Allow me to first deal with this concept of making an appeal to the Father. What is interesting in the text is verse number 19. Because verse number 19 is a contrast from verses 15 and 16. In verses 15 and 16, the brothers, understanding their own guilt, understanding their complicity in the problems of Joseph's life, are weighed down with shame and embarrassment. Their conscience is seared, for they recognize that they are the culprits of evil and are guilty of the wrongdoing that has put Joseph through one headache after another. And so they devise a plan to approach Joseph by appealing to him on the basis of their father Israel. They know that Israel, again known also as Jacob, had a love for Joseph and Joseph for his daddy. And so they come up with this appeal that we must find the means of softening what surely is a hardened heart. Talk to him about what daddy would have wanted. In verses 15 and 16, they say to Joseph that daddy said, Daddy on his deathbed asked that you would be compassionate, asked that you would be merciful. And they made an appeal to their earthly father. But when you get to verse number 19, Joseph's heart was not hardened the way they thought it was. Joseph was not seeking retaliation or revenge. Joseph was not in a place in his heart to exercise judgment. Joseph didn't appeal to his earthly father. He appealed to the heavenly father. What we must understand is that there is no recorded text that shows us that Israel, Jacob, ever made the statements the brother said that their daddy made. And what is interesting is that Joseph, prior to his daddy's departure from this life, had an opportunity to talk to him while he was on his deathbed. And so anything that Israel had to say to Joseph, he certainly had an opportunity to speak to him and make known to him his own wishes, his own, his own desires. And, and there is no recorded text, no indication that this specific conversation had ever been made. But it did not matter. It was irrelevant because Joseph's appeal was not to the heart of his earthly father. Joseph was taken into consideration that he had a God who sits high and looks low. He understood his eternal father, his heavenly father. And while the brothers were acting on the supposed authority of their earthly father, Joseph said, I, 
I'm not in the place of God. He understood that to be a child of God, to be one who is being led by God, one whom God has shined on, has given him blessing after blessing. He understood that in his relationship with God, that he did not have a right. It was not his right. It was not given to him to be in the place of God. We don't have to sit up at night trying to figure out how God's going to fix somebody and trying to exact revenge. We have to appeal to the Father. We have to understand that it is God's sovereign right to deal with folk the way he sees fit. If God desires to give justice, that's his right. If his, his desire to give mercy, that's his right. God does not consult us. He does not need our opinion. He has not asked us to give him a recommendation. In the sovereignty of God, he will deal with folk the way he wants to deal with them. Somebody said, Brother Preacher, that was Joseph. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know how I've been hurt. You, you don't know my headaches. You don't know my heartaches. You don't know who has violated me. Preacher, you just don't understand my circumstance. Well, I may or may not understand your circumstance, but I know someone who does. In Hebrews chapter 4, there is a word here that will bless you as you're trying to make your appeal to the Father. In Hebrews chapter 4, I'd like for you to meet me at verse number 15. There the Bible says, For we have not an high priest which can not be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Hold it right there. What the Bible is saying is that we have a high priest in Jesus the Christ who came in fleshly form. He understands the frailties of human nature because in his earthly appearance he was both God and man at the same time. The fact that he was God gave him the privilege to come down on this uh, terra firma called earth. He was able in his God existence to be God and at the same time without losing his deity he was fully man at the same time and as man he was able to experience the frailties of humanity the weaknesses of humanity he, he knows what it's like to be mistreated he knows what it's like to have been done wrong he, he knows what it's like to be betrayed and for that reason, he is able to sympathize and empathize with us and yet be an example to us because even in all of what he went through, he was without sin. Then verse number 16 in Hebrews chapter 4, the Bible says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We have the privilege of being able to go to God and ask for the grace to deal with folk who mistreat you. So when we think of grace, we think grace of saving grace. We think of traveling grace. But there are sometimes you got to talk to God about some they getting on my nerves grace. There are sometimes you got to talk to God about I've been hurt grace. There are some times you got to talk to God about I've been betrayed grace. There are some times that we have to talk to God and say, I've been mistreated grace. I've been violated grace. The grace of God is not just meant to save us. It's not just meant to protect us as we travel. But the grace of God is meant to help us when we can't help ourselves. It's meant to strengthen us when we find ourselves without strength. It's meant to uplift us when we've been knocked down. It's meant to bless us when we have been burdened. It's meant to correct us when we're off course. The grace of God is ever sufficient and no child of God should be without the blessings of God's grace. But not only does he appeal to the Father, there is an appeal to forgiveness. One of the things we have to learn how to do, 
perhaps one of the hardest things to do when healing hurts is to forgive. Forgiveness is misunderstood by many in the body of Christ because we believe that if we forgive that we are excusing the wrong. We believe that if we forgive that we are letting them off easy, or that somehow we are sanctioning what someone has done. These brothers were seeking forgiveness not recognizing that Joseph had already forgiven them. Allow me to say that whoever has hurt you, has violated you, mistreated you, you would do yourself a world of good to forgive them before they ask and not hold that in your system, not allow yourself to become bitter, not allow yourself to become tainted by the toxic emotions of negativity. As we consider this concept of forgiveness, sometimes we understand that guilty people act like guilty people. These brothers in Genesis chapter 45, as you look at verses four through eight, there the Bible teaches us about this conversation Joseph has with his brethren. The Bible says, and Joseph said unto his brethren, come near to me, I pray you, and they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. But God did send me before you to preserve life. It is interesting that Joseph in chapter 45 has said to his brothers, I forgive you. He has said to his brothers, I, I'm not holding that. I'm, I'm not stuck on that. I'm, I'm in a different place. And yet when they get to chapter 50, they still are acting guilty because guilty people act like guilty people. Guilty people have not dealt with themselves. You may have forgiven them, but they have not forgiven themselves. But let me help you to understand and be motivated by the fact that forgiveness is not always about the other person. It helps the other person, but it's not about the other person. You see, when you forgive, you let go of the anger. When you forgive, you let go of bitterness. When you forgive, you allow yourself to give an eviction to hatred. You allow yourself to give an eviction to envy and to malice and to wrath. The power of forgiveness is a benefit to the person who has been hurt, who has been betrayed, the person who has been done wrong. The best thing you can do for your healing is to ask God for the grace to let go. Someone say, Brother Preacher, how can you forgive injustice? How can you forgive betrayal? What about a person who took advantage of me at a vulnerable time? Lord, what do I do when I feel that I've been manipulated, when, when someone has lied on me, when someone has hurt me with innuendos? And I am called to Ephesians chapter 4, a verse that is of great significance. That is verse number 26, and also verse number 27. I want to help us to learn how to forgive. In verse 26, the Bible says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. God is never criticizing us for righteous indignation. When we have been done wrong, we have a right to be angry. But do not allow your anger 
to control you. Vent your emotions and allow your anger to be expressed. Just don't sin in the process. Look at verse number 27. The Bible says, neither give place to the devil. That word place is better interpreted foothold. It is like the idea of cracking open a door. And a perpetrator, someone who means no good, can get their foot in the door. All they need is just a little space. And by getting their foot in the door, they're able to use the weight of their body and barge their way in. The Bible is saying that in our anger, don't open the door of our hearts where the devil can intrude. Don't, don't allow the devil who wants to perpetrate, who wants to manipulate, who wants to work. Don't, don't give him the space to operate. Don't, don't allow him an opportunity to get in and to do damage. That's why in the same passage, Ephesians 4 and verse 31, the Bible says we have to let it go. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. The Bible is saying that sometimes we are not able to get rid of the burden because we're holding the burden. And there are some times you've got to let it go. There are some times you've got to release it. You've got to cast it, give it to God. But don't keep holding on to your burden. Holding on to pain makes us operate from a hurt place. It causes us to hurt other people. It causes us to sabotage relationships by operating from a hurt place, by keeping the burden we can't reach our blessing. Holding on makes us toxic in our thinking. It makes us reactionary in our emotions. We, we've got to let go. And, and just as we have been forgiven, Ephesians 4.32, we have to forgive others because God has forgiven me. I've got to forgive those who hurt me, those who wronged me. I've got to let that go and you've got to let that go. Not only is there an appeal to the Father, an appeal to forgiveness, we have to focus. And so we have to have an appeal to the right focus. Sometimes our focus becomes skewed and marred because we're in a bad place. We're seething. We can't let it go. Joseph did not focus on what the, the brothers had done to him. He understood that God can work in any circumstance. He knew that God could work through any person and in any way to accomplish his divine purpose. And so often when we've been hurt, we keep recounting what the offender did. We keep rehashing, we keep reliving, and we keep staying in the moment. We have to give that over to God and focus. We, we, we make an appeal to our focus. God can work through any circumstance, any person. He can work in any way to accomplish his purpose. And we need to seek God's purpose in our perspective of life. We need to understand that though he may not create the problems or the resulting pain, he can work with it, he can work in it, and he can work through it to get the glory. Let me give you quickly four purposes God may have and what he allows us to go through. God, number one, has a positional purpose. Based on what we go through, God may be positioning us, like Joseph, to be in a place where we can accomplish his objectives. That place may or may not be a geographical place. It may be an emotional place. It may be a maturity place. It may be a spiritual place. We may only get to that place because of the events 
encounters and experiences that change the trajectory of our lives. So we appeal to you to focus on what God is doing because he may have a positional purpose. Second purpose that God may have is a penitent purpose. Do you not understand that God will often use those experiences and allow us to experience pain so that we can learn to experience sorrow and sympathy for our sins. We easily look at the faults of others, but can we see our faults? David's words in Psalms 51, read it when you get time, it demonstrates the pain in his life about his sin with Bathsheba that led to penitence. It's, it's the idea that sometimes God allows us to go through something because he has a purpose that is designed to bring us to penitence. Third, God sometimes has a perfecting purpose. And that is he will use our sorrows to shape us. Even in the midst of Satan's afflictions. God will allow Satan to afflict us so that God can make us. You don't believe me? Read Luke 22 verses 31 through 34. How God told Peter, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. He does not say I'm going to prohibit it or stop it. I'm not going to hinder it, but I'm going to allow you to go through this because it's going to help perfect you. And he says, and when thou art converted, turn and strengthen your brother. Then there is what I would call God's parenting purpose. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11, the Bible says that God chastises us because he loves us. See, there are sometimes we think the devil is picking on us when it's God whooping us. One of the problems of religion, one of the problems of the Christian experience is that we only talk about God from a favor standpoint. We only talk about God from the standpoint of those things that are advantages, those things that we like, those things that are blessings, those things that are good, those things that are kind. People will brag and say, God blessed me today. But does anybody ever brag and say, God beat me today? See, God who blessed you with the new car, the new house, the new job, whatever those blessings are, he's also blessing you when he's whipping you. Now we get excited, I bought a new car, I got a new house, I got a new job, I got a promotion, I found love, I had a kid, my child graduated. All of those things that are good to us, we brag about them and say God has blessed us, but then when God is whooping us, we feel like God doesn't love us. And according to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11, chastisement is just as much a part of God's love as the blessings that we enjoy. So God has a purpose. Sometimes he's positioning us. Sometimes he's helping bring us to penitence. Sometimes he's perfecting us. And sometimes he's parenting us. Beloved, I have preached long enough to know that people have been through any number of things. Folks have been hurt. I know what hurt is like. I know what it means to feel betrayed, to feel lied on, mistreated. We all have a t-shirt for that club. But you have to allow God to heal the hurts that you otherwise think don't want to heal. When we look at the life of Joseph, Joseph appealed to his father not his earthly father, his heavenly father, who gave him the grace and the spirit to get to a point where he was better as opposed to being at a point where he was bitter. Joseph learned to forgive. He let it go. 
And Joseph had to have the right focus that it is God, not me, who has the right to determine and navigate the circumstances of my life. And I want to say to you that if you have some hurts, and I know you do, give them over to God. Help yourself by having a forgiving heart. And focus not on the burden, but the blessing despite the burden. May God bless you. May God bless this, the Wendy City Lecture, and may God keep you in a very special way. We pray God's blessings in your life. In the name of Jesus, God bless. Somebody prayed for me. Oh, somebody pray for me. I don't know who. I don't know who. I don't even know when, when it was. Oh, but thank God that they did. For I was on my way. On my way to a devil's hell. But look at me now. I'm doing well. Cause now I'm on my way. A better, place. a better place cause somebody, cause somebody pray for me lord somebody pray for me let me tell you somebody prayed for me they must have had me on their mind when i was living in sin far from god I thought I was doing fine Then my days got dark And full of pain See Satan's winds started creeping in But he lost control of my soul Cause somebody prayed for me Yes, somebody prayed for me Glory, hallelujah, somebody, somebody prayed for me. Oh, somebody prayed for me. I don't know who it was, and I can't say when. Oh, but thank God, thank God they did. I was on my way to a devil's hell. But look at me now. I've got a new story to tell Hey, hey, I'm on my way To a better place, y'all Cause somebody, somebody prayed for me Oh, yes, they did Somebody prayed for me Thank you, Jesus Somebody prayed for me When I could not pray for myself But I knew that if I wanted salvation, I had to make a change. The first step was up to me. This is what I did. I went down to the church house and I made this humble plea. I said, when the saints get together to pray for the sinners, oh, please don't forget about me no please don't forget about me and they must have heard me because somebody somebody, somebody prayed, prayed for me, me. Ooh, Lord. Oh, somebody, somebody prayed for me. me I don't know which well, saint I it was know who and I can't tell you when it was. I'm just so but glad God, I'm so glad they, they did see I was on I was headed for certain destruction. Oh, but look at me now. I'm going in a new direction. Hey, hey, I'm on my way to a better place now. Cause somebody, cause somebody prayed for me. Oh, somebody prayed for me. And I know, and I know, and I know that somebody prayed for me. It could have been my oh, darling mother, yeah, for me. 
It could have been my oh, loving father. Pray oh, it could have been, it could have oh, been somebody, somebody who's pray. been through oh, something, and they know that they know oh, that they know that they know what prayer can do. Me. Yes, they know that oh, prayer, prayer can travel across an ocean. Me. Oh, yes, it can, oh, and they know that a prayer. A prayer can travel faster than a bullet can. Hey, they know that prayer, 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 prayer is the only way that we can talk to the Lord. And they know that the prayers of the righteous avail it much. And that's why I'm glad somebody prayed Me.